SEMA collision repair and refinish stage. Uh, our, our topic this morning is improving workplaces, right? How to I, ideas to help with uh, 5S or, you know, sort, set, shine, standardize, and sustain in the workplace. My name is Tony Adams, and I'm with Axel Nobel, and here with my good friend, uh, Andrew, let you introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Battenhorst. I'm the body shop manager at Pacific BMW in Glendale, California. I'm excited to be sharing the stage with you. I think we're going to have a fun Definitely. conversation today. So, yeah. you know, maybe just I'll send a question over. How... Why would a shop want to maybe even think about 5Sing their organization? What are we trying to really solve in, in a 5S environment? That's a great question. I think the heart of the issue is looking at space. You know, uh, body shops typically don't necessarily have all the space that they may want. And 5S is a great tool to help you get where you need to be in terms of maximizing the productivity and floor space that you do have. I think as uh, we all know, technicians uh, tend to want to carry a lot of equipment and maybe spare parts and items that take up valuable space on the floor. And uh, I have a lot of experience with 5S. Uh, I've come from a lean background and uh, my body shop is only 8,200 square feet. So literally every inch of my floor is very, very important for, for productivity. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I bet. And in, and in that productivity space, right, we're also ultimately trying to eliminate waste. Correct. Right? So yeah. can maybe you touch a little bit on some of the waste that we're trying to eliminate and what that really means? Are we talking about stuff that goes in the trash or what are we talking not, about Not here? quite. So the waste uh, you're referring to, Tony, is uh, there's two different types specifically for the shop environment, which would be uh, transportation waste or motion waste. Uh, transportation would be waste that you see for the physical movement of, of an item inside the shop. So that could be a technician walking to the other side of the shop uh, to drop off a part. Uh, and then on the motion side, that could be the physical act of, of a process that involves the movement of the work product into other aspects of the repair process uh, that, that is causing waste maybe inadvertently that we're not aware of. Yeah, so when I think of waste, I'm thinking, you know, also, you know, wasting time that goes along with that motion, right? And, right. and somebody looking for a piece of equipment or parts for the vehicle or other things, right? And right. so in this right, first step, maybe let's talk about, you know, sort. So yeah. the, what, what are we doing when we're talking about 5S in relation to sort? Yeah, so that this, you know, I could use this to kind of kick off the whole what to do or, or how to understand what each of these steps mean. So um, this is an event that I do with my team once every six months. And it's, uh, we set aside maybe about two to three hours in an afternoon. It may take more time to do this if you've never done it before, as typically the first time is a big purge of, of uh, items to get out. But with SORT, we're talking about taking a workspace and literally emptying it of all the items that are inside that stall. Uh, you want to make sure there's no active cars being worked on, all the toolboxes, anything, racking, storage cabinets, remove that completely from the work area and you're going to set up three piles. Um, and I like to use little cones on the floor to help them organize it. So one is going to be an item that you're keeping to put back into the stall. Another pile would be for taking home items that should not be there. And then the other one would be maybe items that might require repair or something that you're not necessarily sure of. So that, that sort. Yeah, and maybe also something that it, uh, would go into that pile is like we want to keep it, it just doesn't belong here, they are, right. right in this in this space. Right. So in that piece of sorting, I think I've heard the term referred to as like a red tag event too. Right? Correct. Is yeah, getting... yeah. You may find that there's equipment that the that you are not aware is broken or that it's it's no longer being used effectively in that for doing day to day repair work. So that's the time to really do that, and and to kind of touch on maybe some of the challenges of this. Body technicians especially can be very possessive over some of those items, and it could definitely make people uncomfortable. So it's not necessarily, it, it, you have to frame the exercise as gaining your space back. How are you gonna you know, benefit from doing this? So, but yeah, that's, that's really the best way to start out with sort. No. So you said you got 8,000 square feet. So I'm curious, that seems like that'd be 
a, a long time to get through more than two or three hours. Do you like try and just identify a stall or do you do a department or what does that look like? I've done like? both. So it, it depends on the condition of the environment you're going into. You have to factor in who's going to be involved to do this event with your team uh, and how much clutter and disarray is going on. So typically, I uh, at this point now, I do it so frequently where I could break it into departments and they can get the work going uh, as they need to. But uh, if it's if it's a bigger area with more moving people and parts in there, it may take longer, it may take more than one day to complete. So once we move through that sorting, so if I understand this right, Andrew, we're gonna take everything out of the stall, we're gonna separate it into three piles. Um, I assume then that we're going to you know, work on uh, cleaning the space and, and yes. figuring out how to kind of set, is that what's next? Yeah, usually with set or shine, they're, they're interchangeable. So uh, depending on the condition of the building itself and the stall space you're working in, you may have to go in with pressure washers, get some paint, get some striping tape, you may decide that there's things that have to be done to kind of set the foundation for that new work area before you can go into to putting things back in. So the shining process can take, that may take into another day to complete. So that's where you have to be mindful of doing this, how it's gonna interrupt production while you're trying to get this process going. Very important. Yeah, it seems like that makes a lot of sense. So we've got it removed. We're kind of cleaning the place up. We're shining. Uh, we're going to start setting things and where we want them to go now that we've got all of this excess stuff yeah. that shouldn't have been maybe in that space. Right. So let's maybe get, because I think those are all pretty easy, but what's standardization look like? Well, before we go to standardize, I want to talk about set real quick. All right, so go. with putting set, uh, the set phase is my favorite part okay. because that is where you give the freedom to the technician to set it up the way they can be the most efficient with that new space. So that may require setting up a, a pegboard uh, or a shadow board in, your, in that stall. It could be adding wall hooks. It could be reconfiguring figuring the, the f furniture, because this process applies not just inside the, the shop floor, you could do this in your office, you could do this in any area, you could do it in your garage at home at, personally. So, so thinking back to that transportation in the office, like where maybe is the copier machine right. located that we're all having to walk through, right? Are we right. having to, that, that excess motion and, and exactly. transporting the paperwork back and forth for right. scanning purposes or something, so it doesn't right. just be isolated to the, to the actual shop floor. Yeah. And you want to, under that mindset, you want to keep the technician in the stall working as much as possible. The more time they're spent wandering around to try and find something, the more lost productivity you're going to have. So once you've got the set aspect set up, you've cleaned, you've got, you know, you've let the technician kind of explore what works best for them. It's not a one size fits all where I'm coming in as a manager to say, hey, you've got to do it this way. It, it's, that will be a recipe for disaster. So coming into the last two phases of that, standardize is now, so the technician has built the stall to their kind of spec. Now what I do is I take a photograph of the completed stall and I laminate it and I hang it up on the wall in the stall. So now that is the standard of what that stall should look like at the end of business that day. Throughout the day they're working, they're pulling cars in and out, they're doing different things. I expect the, the stall to be used and things to get out of place a little bit. But the standardized aspect is to ensure the next morning they're not coming in sweeping and cleaning and mopping and doing all these things that are not productive for that for the work day, it's just them coming to work and working and getting going with the day. So in that piece of standardization, right, that photograph that's laminated that's posted up on the wall is, is a visual indicator or reminder of what that's supposed to look like? Is right. it a shared space that if somebody else come? Yeah, it's kind of respect your neighbors, so to speak, right? So if someone's coming into your workspace and they're going to use that stall and they see, okay, up on the wall, you know, the brooms need to go here, the trash is here, the toolbox goes back there. That's where mapping the things out during the set phase on the floor with tape and having a designated spot, you know, the old saying, a place for everything, everything has its place. That's what that visual sign on the wall is doing. That's reinforcing that theory that, hey, respect it when you're in my home, leave it as, as you found it. And that, that becomes, you know, we'll get to sustain, but that kind of ties into that. 
Yeah. yeah, so I think that it's a great segue here right into the, the fifth S in sustain. And uh, we were talking a little bit about some of the, the leadership aspects and, and things. So, so what does it look like to make this stick so that you're not in, into a place where this is a, a one-time event, yeah. right? I, like I see shops that try to do this and it just becomes an event and it doesn't stick because it hasn't become part of the culture. Right. I think it's the fifth S yeah. that's probably the hardest. Can you touch on that? Yeah, it's funny because a lot of people say, well, I, I'm a master of three S's. That's as far as I got. And then it started to slip. So uh, Danny Meyer has a famous th uh, theory and Danny is a restaurant, very famous restaurant owner on the East Coast. And it's the salt, uh, salt shaker theory. Uh, you, when you go into one of his restaurants, the tables are all set up the same way when you walk in. You have the salt and pepper, the napkin holder, you got the, the tablecloth, the utensils. You know, when a patron comes into that restaurant, they expect that table to be set up the same way. And obviously people come, they use the table and whatnot, but the table has to be set back for the next person to come in to be, you know, have it set to that standard that they're known for. And as a leader, that is probably the most crucial element of all of these five S's because you have to give that gentle nudge. You have to give that reinforcing factor to all of this to make sure it's gonna stick. So the moment that you set this all up, you put it all in play, you invest the time and maybe money and energy to do this, if you don't reinforce that, yes, the stall has to look this way or this area has to look this way at the end of business, it's gonna all slowly start to unravel because as humans, we look for the easiest way out, right? We're looking for the, the nice, comfortable cruising spot. And as a leader, you have to build time into your day-to-day -day activities to make sure the sustaining aspect is continuing. Um, that is where the photos come in, the giving them the autonomy to set the work area how they want. It's a two-way street. It's, it does not become a, an authoritative position if you do this every day. It just becomes a habit at that point. And then the technicians begin to realize, hey, that doesn't belong here. That doesn't, that's not for here. Or maybe there's something that needs to be revised. And that's, that's why we do it every six months because business may have changed. Maybe there's a new car that requires uh, more parts to take off or uh, more storage, right? You know, if you went from working on one model and now you've got a big truck coming in, maybe the space needs to adapt to that. So that's where having that flexibility of doing this process continually uh, can allow you to adapt to your, to your team changing, to the work product changing, and allow you to really make sure the space is not being wasted. And I think it's important, you know, I, I like that uh, salt shaker theory, yeah. one of my favorite concepts. Yeah. I think it's uh, constant gentle pressure, yes. right? And, and helping just remind, and, and that helps also, right, help create the culture that this is what we're trying to achieve. And, and, and as a leader, we really have to just help, right? Like this, not that. Right. And, and help encourage them to put the stuff back every day. Otherwise, that's where it starts to, to, to wane away, right? Right. And I think there's also an element of when you're in the shop every day, you don't tend to notice all this waste that's happening. And, you, and your team may not even notice it because they're, they're comfortable in that environment. And as we, as we move through time and we move through closing the month and going to events or, or dealing with customers or an equipment malfunction, you don't really always have time to do that failure analysis of why are we doing like this? Or even just to put the simple question, why at all into your head? And this is a great way to kind of set that stage for building the bandwidth into your day-to-day -day activities to allow you to, to make that question. And my favorite response to that is we've always done it that way, yeah. Andrew. Yeah. That's because we're comfortable, right? Yeah, and absolutely. As we know, that has also been on, on wider implications in our industry. That comfort level has also led to many other problems that we've had. So this is a great tool that doesn't really cost a lot of money to, to roll out. It, maybe the first time you do it, you may have an investment in racking, uh, in, in, in striping, and, and things like that. But it's minimal in compared to the, to the productivity gains you will get from setting up your, your work area like this. Yeah, so I think this is a good segue, right? Uh, this is how to implement ideas. So I, I think we've done a decent job of kind of explaining what 5S looks like. What would you... Where would you start? Or where did you start in your shop when you came in and this 
things aren't 5S. How do, how do you begin? I'm not going to lie. I was completely overwhelmed. When I took over my shop, this was a traditionally run body shop without some of those elements in there. And uh, I didn't know where to start. So I, I, I chose repair planning as the first one to go in and do that because I felt that that would provide the immediate impact I was looking for. And uh, in doing so, I also had to earn the buy-in from my team about, well, what the hell are you doing? What is this all about? And there's some really great resources online on YouTube and uh, Gemba Academy. You have Two Second Lean by Paul Akers. There's all these great resources that introduce people in a very low pressure way that allows them to understand these concepts uh, and see maybe from a different industry even to, to observe how it works and start to jog some ideas into their heads about, hey, that's not so bad. I kind of like that. I also incentivize it. So when certain milestones are hidden in the, in the shop, I give out Kaizen foam, which is uh, made by FastCap, uh, for their toolboxes. So that way, they have a visual way of looking in their boxes very quickly and seeing, hey, this tool is out of place. Um, I don't, you know, th th that that can really help them see, like, I'm invested not just on a shop level because. We, we own the shop, not them, right. but on an individual level, these theories can translate into increased productivity that can affect their, their pay in many cases. So you said um, you incentivize yeah. this. Can you give us or share maybe an example of what uh, a benchmark or a KPI that you're looking at from an incentivization, or maybe I misunderstood? No, it's, it, it's uh, I use it kind of as a, it's a, not so much a formal bonus, so to speak, but I use it as an opportunity uh, when they, when like a younger technician completes a certain milestone, I may, you know, buy the Kaizen phone, for example, or, or give them some type of positive encouragement about engaging with these processes. So when you tie these concepts back together, there has to be the, the what's in it for me aspect of it. So. That may be a little more intangible, and that may depend on the rapport you build with your employee. As you get to know them more, maybe you find out they like to go dirt bike riding, and you get them a, a gift card to a vendor that they could buy stuff for their dirt bike from, or, or uh, you know, movie tickets, or whatever. There's so many ways to build that kind of trust and say, hey, thank you for, for following along, because I think far often we, we bring things into the shop and just say, you're doing it because I told you to do it. And then you get what I like to call is malicious compliance. And that's very dangerous. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Yeah. And I like that you're focusing on rewarding the behavior that you're ultimately looking for. Right. Right? Like, right. like we're gonna we're we're gonna encourage that because sometimes our reward systems don't match uh, yeah. the behavior that ultimately we're looking for. Right, moment. and you're incentivizing the wrong thing. That's that could be a, as just as dangerous as not doing some of these activities that we're talking about. So I, I, again, I hope that people can see that there, I, I think commonly in the industry, there is a shroud of mystery around 5S and how you do it and how often you should do it and who should be involved and all that. But I think choose, choose a department, spend some time maybe just observing what's happening in that department, get the feedback from the team, spend some time introducing the subject to them. Um, I know Axel Nobel has done really good with taking uh, people on field trips to industries outside of collision to show how some of these theories are being done in, in something completely different. And sometimes those ideas bring bring a lot of new thoughts into back into the organization. Yeah, you had mentioned uh, Two Second Lean, Paul Akers, one of my yes. favorite books, a great friend of mine, Casey Lund, introduced me to it uh, years and years ago, right? But it's finding those little things that don't take very much time, right? Just uh, two seconds, like to find, the, find right. the things in it and ultimately was around fix what bugs you. Yes. And, and I really like that concept and, and some of the videos that Paul Akers has got posted out there that even would apply to the, the collision repair shop, right? Lifting a, a trash can and constantly having to, you know, get that, that catch pulled up. Like, yeah. take your grinder out and grind the back of that thing off, right? Like, over the course of your life, a lifting a trash can lid that ends yeah. up with hours and days and weeks, of course, of, you know, 50, 50 years or, or right. whatever. Right. So, so once we've done this 5S, how, 
Can you share maybe some things that you do to, to encourage some of that two-second lean kind of thinking within the, in the facility and encouraging some of those daily improvements? I think it's two things. One, it's me being available in the shop as a facilitator, so to speak, or as a coach maybe is a better word to use. Just making myself available to them because they, they know how passionate I am about it. And uh, I, I'm this way even in my personal life. My, it drives my wife crazy, but she, she sees the benefit in what I'm doing. But even in the shop, I think there, with me leading the charge, that really starts to drive home the message. And the other aspect I think is that they're taking ownership of their own space and it's not dictated to them how it needs to be. And once that's, that's kind of out there, things start to, the dynamic changes, and it becomes very relaxed and simple. And I have found by repeatedly, the, the sustaining aspect is so firmly in place that, like for instance, next week, when I'm back in the shop, we're set to do some 5S events, and I know right now they've already actually started preparing. And I'm not even there. And they're, and they're already taking ownership on their own. Yeah, and I love the fact that it's theirs. They own it. Like you've yeah. said that multiple times in, in our time here. I know I most certainly made that mistake in my house. Yeah. And, and 5Sing somebody else's right area, and in my case it was my wife's, and I hated the messy silverware drawer, yeah. so I bought some Kaizen foam and I cut out lots of places for the forks and a 10 millimeter socket on either side <laughs> so I could pull it out. Yeah. She wasn't very happy with me 5S in her area. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, and I've made those mistakes. Uh, so I, 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 I want to lend some credence that as a shop manager, I, I, I've tripped and fallen and gotten back up. And I, I've had technicians balk at the idea of why are you even doing this? This makes no sense. And then some of those biggest opponents of it ended up becoming the biggest supporters in, in the end. So it's the juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would I would agree with that. And so important, right, to go, hey, listen, I messed that up. Yeah. yeah. As the leader, like, yeah. listen, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Like, yeah. Let's try this again. And it just shows that, you know, we're human beings and we're going to make some mistakes and, right. and let's figure out how we make this better moving forward. But not to punish them, not to make yeah. them feel bad. And there's some days where I'll walk through the shop and if I know it's a big job that's going on, and I know that they can't put the stall back to the way the photo looks. I'm not going to come and pull them into my office and say, hey, Bob, you've got a problem here. What's going on? It's no, I, I get it. And once the car's out of the stall for the next job, they know to set it back in order and, and reevaluate. I know you're in the middle of this frame rail replacement and apron replacement and the yeah. whole front end, is, but I expect, yeah, we yeah. can't do that, right? There's right. got to be a little flexibility. Ultimately, right, it's about gaining some of those efficiencies and giving people time back by getting things cleaned up and organized so when we're ready to go to that next job and we're ready to move on to the next thing, right. it's ready to go. Right. I think one other thing we haven't really talked about is like the, the impact on the shop because by reorganizing the space we found we could gain another couple stalls we could use for productive output. And as we know, every square inch has a dollar amount kind of invisibly floating over it. Um, so there is a financial benefit to getting more throughput through the, for the technicians and for the shop overall. I mean, we look at, I know ACOAT uses the uh, sales per square foot measurement, and there's a lot of other metrics that can help you realize, is 5S an opportunity in my workspace, or have I really tapped this to the full potential? And that, that is, that's kind of an unspoken tool that I think more of us in the industry can really benefit from. Yeah, I agree. I, I can see where you could pick up some stalls. I've definitely been in some in some facilities where there's stuff piled up and, oh, yeah. and, and, and not necessarily organized the way it is and actually being able to gain more space. Yeah. And, critical for sure right. in your environment in 8,000 square feet, but yeah. just as critical in a shop that's in 30,000 square feet. Right. We have a tendency as humans, the more space we get, the more we fill up that space with stuff. That's why for when we do five, these 5S activities, we don't use closed cabinets. No, none of the, the doors that close. Everything is on a wire rack that is open. It doesn't gather dust on the wire rack. The, the shelves stay clean and everybody can see that's what is on the shelf. And then it, it prevents it from getting all cluttered up with stuff that shouldn't be there. The other item uh, we didn't touch on was make sure things are on wheels. The more stuff that is on wheels in the shop that makes it easy to move around and reduce that motion or transportation waste is huge. It also helps to reduce injuries. That's kind of like the unspoken element. I'll give an example before we wrap up here. But uh, 
we on BMWs, which is primarily what I fix, the exhaust systems are one long piece that run from the engine all the way to the tailpipe. They're one solid unit. My guys would always have to stop and get a couple people to help them move it to the storage area. And uh, I asked, I said, hey, do you guys think it would benefit if we had a dolly for, for these items? And they said, yeah, that would really save some effort. It would take the strain, possible risk of injury, of hurting ourselves from trying to carry these in an awkward fashion. I said, okay, so I start doing some research online, and I find there is no such thing as a muffler or dolly to move mufflers around. And I said, okay, well, what do you guys think this should look like? We came up with a very crude sketch on a piece of paper. I said, okay, so I went to the steel yard. I bought, you know, 30, 40 linear feet of square tubing. And uh, we were slow, and I stayed late a couple days, and we welded up a dolly, and then we welded up an actual storage unit that's all on wheels. And uh, one guy can now dolly an entire exhaust system through the shop to the storage area by himself. And uh, they love it. And it makes things, I actually, I need to build another one now. They told me it's so good, we want more. So having the wherewithal to think outside the box about what are we doing with the space? How are they engaging with the cars and the tools and all that? And giving some type of uh, logistical structure to what they're doing all ties into these theories. I, I love that story. It's just, it, it's absolutely about the culture that's been built around, right? These, these things that are going to make it easier, right? Like our like technicians work really, really hard. Yeah. And we're, we're not asking people to work harder. We're asking them to work smarter and let's yes. figure out ways. And once it becomes part of the culture of the organization, you end up with these great creative ideas. Like instantly I'm thinking about not just, you know, the, the, the physical ailments of carrying some of that stuff, but now right. one person can move it instead of two people moving it. And, right. and, and one once you get to that place of kind of horizontal and, and diagonal accountability within the organization, it's where this really starts to uh, to take off. Yeah. So we got just a, a couple of minutes left. Again, uh, coming out of this uh, this little session with us, and and maybe final words for uh, shops on how to go back and get started. Don't be scared. That's probably the the the, the to sum it up uh, easiest. And and look at. Look inward first about what you want out of the space, what you want from your team, and the overall goals of your operation, and think about the impact it has. Put yourself in their shoes and engage with the space how they engage with it, and that will really start to open your eyes up to things that may not be going according to plan. Spend some time. I know it may be hard, especially with everything that's going on. We all, as leaders, have very busy days, but the more you could spend observing things and getting your head out of the day-to-day -day grind, the, the more you can engage with these tools and really make a, a big difference in the work you know, quality of, of life in the shop. Yeah. Yeah. And, a, and an extra focus on the positive reinforcement when we Absolutely. see them doing the stuff that we're ultimately trying to achieve. You praise that. Yeah, you reward that. You, you, you want to keep that, you know, and then if there is an opportunity, frame it in a way for, for improvement. Don't scold, don't, you know, you know, again, as we mentioned earlier, there could be some struggles with putting it in play, but having one-on-one -on -one conversations, maybe taking, the, taking a different approach with that individual employee that's struggling, don't give up. You know, they're, they're, it, like I said, I've had some pretty big detractors that thought it was a waste of time that became, they've, they've taken it farther than I would have dreamed. Yep. So. Yeah, I think, right, the, the story of the light bulb, right? I didn't, I didn't fail, it just didn't work a thousand times, right? right. And it's gonna keep, keep going and keep trying right. and keep working on it because it's get gonna there. take practice. And, yeah. and it's a bit of a shift of thinking, right? It's hard to, like, we keep grabbing stuff, like you said, and we wanna just, the more space we have, the right. more we wanna attach more things to us. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, it's difficult to get the mind shift, so you just gotta stick with it and keep rewarding what you're looking for, I think, yeah. at the it's, end of the what's day. What's the old saying? Inspect what you expect. Inspect what you expect. What yes. a novel idea, yeah. yeah. I have, so yeah, that's why you got to keep this going, right? Yes. At the end of the day. Yes, sir. So. All right. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Andrew. It's a good conversation. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you. Thank you.